Um, it's an honor to be introduced, it's, a, it's an honor to be invited to introduce our speakers tonight, all authors and advocates, all parents of children with Down syndrome. I want to thank my dear friend Rachel Adams, who is in the middle of the table and is one of our presenters tonight, for inviting me to moderate, and it is not an obvious one, the invitation for me to come. I do not write on disability issues, nor have I penned a memoir. I am a trained art historian who works in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at NYU. So I'm an academic, so if that qualifies me, I guess. Where I qualify it, if at all, is in the sustained conversations Rachel and I have had now for almost six years about our sons and about making sense of them, the richness of their personalities, the administrative hurdles that surround their health, education, and well-being, and about how to blend, even make sense of, the connection we have with our sons as their mothers and the intellectual activity which we have been trained in, which requires the constant critical examination of nomenclature, classification, and value. We are fortunate tonight in that we have a trio of exceptional parent authors to help us think through the issue of parenting, narrative, and our genetic futures. Not only as they apply to individual families or exceptional children, but also to the greater implications that discussions of Down syndrome have for the way society perceives difference and ability, and the impact of those views on research in the health and sciences. That dance, you know the one, between personal and private, listening and advocating, being compassionate, and forcefully expressing an opinion, is one that our three authors have been doing for quite some time. It requires great risk tanking, and at times exposing oneself to criticism, making oneself vulnerable, because the particular well-crafted stories of themselves and ones that many of us may have read, read written by them and their families are, of course, now in print and on the internet and in wide circulation. So it also requires a great deal of bravery, I think, to put oneself out there in that way. A bravery that, unfortunately, I myself don't have, and I'm very grateful that they do. <clears throat> so let me introduce our speakers. Alice, Alison Pepmeyer is Director of Women's and Gender Studies at the College of Charleston. She has written extensively on feminism and has a forthcoming book on feminist disability studies. She has shared her views on parenting a child with Down syndrome and beyond, many more things than just uh, being a parent in her blog, Every Little Thing. Currently, she is preparing a book titled A Choice with No Story, What Prenatal Testing and Down Syndrome Reveal About Our Reproductive Decision Making. I first read Allison's work actually thanks to Rachel, I think, who, who must have sent me the link or the, the, the scan at some point when we were talking about, about her writing, and it's a really brilliant essay titled Saints, Sages, and Victims, Endorsement of and Resistance to Cultural Stereotypes and Memoirs by Parents of, Down, of Children with Disabilities. And it showed me that it is possible to be invested, generous, and critical when writing about issues of great personal interest and broad social impact. George Estrich, who I'm, I'm very happy uh, now to, to be listening to for the, for the third time in two years, and that's really a great privilege. Um, he is the author of The Shape of the Eye, Down Syndrome Family and the Stories We Inherit, which is um, on the table. You can take a look at it after the panel. It was originally published in 2011 and is now out in paperback, and in 2012 won the Oregon Book Award in Creative Nonfiction. He is also the author of two books of poetry, which um, find presence in his prose through the wonderful images that George creates for his readers about his family. And if you dip into his memoir, you'll really see that there's a, a particular way in which he writes prose that is clearly informed by his poetic sensibility. George has taught at Cornell University, the University of Pennsylvania, Duke University, and most recently at Oregon State University. Uh, Rachel Adams is likely familiar to many of you. Um, she, of course, teaches here at Columbia University in the English and American Studies departments. She is the director of the Future of Disability Studies Project at Columbia and has authored numerous books and articles, um, many which intersect more with my academic field than her, than her most recent one, but her most recent one is the one that I enjoyed most reading, which is Raising Henry, a memoir of motherhood, disability, and discovery, which is also on the table after the panel. Rachel is also a board member and coordinator for adult programs at Gigi's Playhouse New York City, a Down Syndrome Achievement Center, and I have to thank her on behalf of our community of parents for bringing George and Allison to the Playhouse yesterday afternoon 
for what was a very rich and engaging conversation about parenting and advocacy. Thinking about tonight's discussion and the topic, I wanted to start by pulling um, some brief quotes just from our author's writings. These are really just snippets to whet your appetite. And they were quotes that were important to me because it helped me remember in thinking about tonight's discussion, um, really who are the individuals who inspire their work. Um, so let me read you from, from Allison's um, article from the New York Times, Outlawing Abortion Won't Help Children with Down Syndrome, where she writes, eloquently, but also I thought really quite simply and directly. Um, Maybelle has Down syndrome, a condition I knew almost nothing about before she was born. During the four years she has been alive, I have been repeatedly surprised by her curiosity, her individual sense of humor, and how much she has accomplished. She doesn't fit the stereotypes at all. George wrote in his book uh, another very poignant insight into his daughter, Laura, <clears throat> As with appetite, the switch lay within Laura. It seems sometimes that she holds out on us, perversely, in order to remind us she's not a machine to be programmed. Like her father and her father's mother, she's as stubborn as a brick when her mind is made up, and even more stubborn when it's not. Sometimes I think she's as weary as I am of developmental charts, of the incessant, nagging whisper to advance, advance. She keeps her counsel. She takes the next step when it suits her. Until then, her refusals are concise, deliberate, more expressive than any word. And finally, an excerpt from Rachel's uh, memoir about Henry, and I should admit that I know Henry quite well because he and my son are within about a month of each other and are, and are really good friends. So, um, so this excerpt is, is one from her really um, uh, in-depth memoir, but it's one of the rare moments, I think, that she um, is more intimate in her, in her revelations about Henry. I couldn't have known about his great sense of humor or the sound of his infectious laugh or the smell of his hair, the delight he gets from singing along with music or pouring bath water from one cup to another, his weight on my lap when we're reading a book together. So for me, these are just the briefest of insights into what you'll see is a very rich reflection on the part of three really dynamic, brave, and challenging authors. So please help me welcome them tonight for tonight's conversation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Georgia, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm going to read first, um, and then read from, from my memoir. And I, I've really um, been back and forth for a long time about what exactly to read tonight. I wanted to have something that was um, focused particularly on this forum, and so poor Rachel wound up having the, the, the wrong things that I was going to read for her response, so I apologize for that. Um, what We've all been um, writing about Allison and Rachel and I um, uh, in one way or another is the advent of new technologies. So one of the, the biggest changes on, on the horizon now um, that, that is essentially here is the non-invasive prenatal tests. Uh, I should say non-invasive prenatal screens. So these can predict uh, Down syndrome and some other chromosomal conditions with very high degree of accuracy as at <coughs> early as 10 weeks of pregnancy. They are not tests. If they come up positive, they still call for amnio or CVS, but they, they are far more accurate than previous screens um, have been. Um, this is obviously going to be a, a big money maker. It's going to really change the game in terms of how um, reproduction is thought of, how disability is thought of, and as other conditions become predictable and as they theoretically are, we're going to be faced with a lot of questions about what, um, what constitutes health. What, what, what is a condition that falls under health, and what's a condition that falls under human variation? Now, my own experience um, with Laura has been that for most people, it's not even a question that Down syndrome is a medical condition. And yet for me, Laura, it is Laura's way of being human. And, and I say that with us having lived through some of the, the more dire medical probabilities that come from it. We, we see um, her disability as a part of who she is. Um, so the question for me as a writer is, it's, it's a double question, and this is one I thought of as, as I was writing my memoir. One is how to, how to represent Laura fairly, which is to say 
in a way that she would approve of when she's able to understand the portrait, in a way that's not exploitive, in a way that illuminates her individuality as a person without uh, downplaying or ignoring the, the biological facts of Down syndrome, um, and in a way that does not make her, uh, that doesn't weaponize her in an argument that says she is who she is, um, but not to say, well, you're wrong, all kids with Down syndrome are just super and, and wonderful, it's, but r rather to say, there are 400,000 people with Down syndrome in this country, and this is one. And maybe instead of saying they are sweet or they are like this, let's, let's hold off on generalizing, because it's that act of generalization that is, is troublesome. So, um, so this, this um, little preamble, I guess, I, I hope will explain what I want to do today, which is to talk, um, tell stories a little bit, because the book is mainly narrative, but also to um, look a little more closely at how the story of Down syndrome is told, how we describe it. And one thing I did as I, as I wrote my book was just try and get my hands on every description of Down syndrome I could and see what's, what's the pattern here and where do those patterns come from. So I, I, that, that's what I'd like to do today. I've, Allison and I have uh, assembled a really rudimentary PowerPoint, it's really just a slideshow. And um, we thought that the pictures can make a point that, is, that can be somewhat cumbersome. So I want to start, I'm going to be re starting from the beginning and talking about some times when we were, you know, I, my wife, were really worried about Laura and what that would all mean. But I, I did want to show a picture of what's happening now. This is more typical now. Um, th um, this is me and Laura on our way to Bertram's Metals in Albany, Oregon, uh, to sell about 250 pounds of scrap metal. Uh, we we I have demolished and mostly renovated an old house, or, or gutted rather, not demolished, and that means taking out all the old pipes and then selling in the scrap metal. So because it's silly to just throw something out there. Yeah. So and she loved this. She she just thought it was the greatest thing. So um, so that's that's just bear that in mind when I'm reading these these really uh, depressing bits in the beginning. <laughs> Introduction. We were waiting for our family doctor. I felt not serene, but expectant, uncertain. Teresa lifted Laura from her car seat and set her, still sleeping, on the clean white paper of the exam table. I got out colored pencils and a notebook for Ellie. We were paging through magazines when Dr. E came in, knocking softly. He closed the door, crossed the room, and turned towards us. We got the lab tests back, he said. Nancy called and had them faxed down here. He paused. Laura does have Down syndrome, he said. Ellie was coloring quietly. From where I was standing, I could see the first tears forming in Teresa's eyes. I believe, he said, that these children come to the families most able to take care of them. No one said anything. Ellie kept drawing her rainbow, keeping the colored lines parallel. There was a bump in the first line she'd drawn, and she copied it through all the succeeding lines, the blip softening into a gentle swell. Ellie, meticulous, precise, absorbed. She didn't seem to register the news. Teresa stared up at the doctor, her eyes wet. I felt nothing, only the grip of fact, so I began asking questions, setting them out like planks heaved across quicksand. What do we do? Whom do we contact? What do we need to know? I thought a lot about that moment in the weeks following, the way Dr. E turned towards us, the door easing towards an institutional click, his face pinker than usual, the hush in his voice, his gentleness. All said that the news was coming. Laura did have Down syndrome. The question attending her birth had been answered, but that answer only seemed another question, where it was, like the chromosome itself, the beginning of a thousand questions. Clearly an answer was called for. I began to read. I wanted to understand what Laura had. <coughs> Down syndrome, as I learned, is a chromosomal disorder. Chromosomes are long strings of DNA, the molecule that encodes inheritance. Taken together, they constitute a genome, a full set of instructions for guiding development from the fertilized egg. Most people have 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom, 23 from dad, a perfectly matched set. People with the main form of Down syndrome have an extra copy of the 21st chromosome, the smallest. Because that extra copy is present at conception, it is preserved faithfully through each successive cell division, and 10 trillion cells or so later, it is ubiquitous in the body. Having an extra chromosome makes for significant changes. People with Down syndrome have a distinctive look, almost always with almond-shaped eyes. They have some degree of intellectual disability, usually in the mild to moderate range. 
and they're at increased risk for a number of medical problems, including heart defects, intestinal malformations, and leukemia, though an individual child may have none of these. There are also features you wouldn't notice if you weren't looking for them, like a single line across the palm. Writing this description, I know it is necessary and misleading, accurate and deeply false. A syndrome means, at root, a running together. When you have a child, it all runs together. The heart defect, the eyes, the way her voice sounds, the name of the speech therapist, the worries over the future, the joys of discovery, the sliding sense, slow, quiet, enormous, an avalanche in the skull, that different is not as different as you thought. The genes produce the child who lives a story, whose story is bound up with yours. So reducing a child to a heap of medical fragments is, for a parent, a complicated and dissonant act. It is a necessary fiction, a story one tells only in order to move on. Nobody, so far as I know, finds out that a newborn child has Down syndrome, shrugs, and returns to decorating the nursery. We were undone by the news for a long time. If Down syndrome were ordinary in the world, if a common sense view of dignity and personhood and capability prevailed, then perhaps our early days would have been easier, but Down syndrome is not ordinary in the world. I kept looking things up against whispers in my own brain, against shocked silence, against the raw unfamiliarity of our newest family member. I turned to fact. I felt not just ignorant, but culpably ignorant. And yet in my reading, I only found my own confusion writ large. I felt that Laura's life was valuable, that she was a child, a sister and daughter and granddaughter above all, that she might learn and thrive. I also felt that our lives were over, that her birth was a tragedy, and that we were condemned to a half-life of hospitals, acronyms, therapists, and forms. In my unhinged research, I discovered that everything was true. She was a child first, but of course she could have this problem, this one, this one, and this one. Or the big list came first, typically framed as they. They have heart defects, intestinal atresias, low IQs, joint problems, and on and on, but they're happy little tykes. None of it made sense. I did not see how a child could be happy if she had so many problems. I did not see how, with so many problems, she could be a child first. I'd sought refuge in fact, like someone who ducks into a cathedral for quiet and instead finds an echo chamber for every footfall. Or I was the echo chamber, thronged with a dense collision of numbers and hope and resignation. There were, it seemed, two kinds of stories told about my daughter. In one, she seemed to be a developing child. In the other, she seemed not even human. She was a defect, a tragedy, an abnormality. I did not see how she could be both. It was as if Teresa had given birth to a blur. So at yesterday's um, uh, program at Gigi's Playhouse, one of the things I talked about was this discovery after Laura was born and then diagnosed that I actually thought things about Down syndrome. I would have, if you'd asked me, I would have, before, I, I didn't know anything. I would have gone like, well, you know, no opinion. I knew one kid who, my older daughter went to their birthday party and no opinion, but in fact, yeah, I turned out to have a lot of beliefs because my reaction to Laura's arrival was not neutral. And so a lot of my, um, what I was doing in this book was to look at that reaction kind of as a lens on the ideas that are floating around. I'm going to read two short sections from, uh, these are, this is also from early in Laura's life. This is uh, uh, when she was about three and a half months old, she had heart surgery. And uh, so this is a couple of, of points from the, um, the aftermath of that. Uh, this is just about a day after the uh, operation. Think of it this way, said Bonnie, the nurse. Suppose you're being attacked by a bear, a grizzly bear. Your body's going to send as much fluid as it can right into its tissues and keep it there for a while. So you don't bleed to death, I asked. Right, she said, exactly. So when your daughter had her heart operated on, as far as she's concerned, that's like being attacked by a bear. Her body doesn't know the difference. You could see it looking at her face. She was puffy, her eyelids swollen. The catheter tube was nearly empty. Every hour, the nurse would lift the tube, letting the urine run down to the graduated lucite box. Eventually, the doctor stepped up the diuretics. We had never been so happy to see urine. Tens of milliliters, hundreds. The nurse is smiling, the doctor's smiling, everyone's smiling. This was the beginning of recovery. That night, Teresa's mom and Ellie came to the hospital to see Laura. 
they'd be flying back east the next morning, then returning in a week. We didn't know what Ellie would think. Ellie was, is my older daughter, she was then five. Uh, so we prepared her carefully, saying, now we can't touch her, and she has a lot of tubes in her, and it might be a little scary, but Ellie was used to seeing tubes by now. She walked in and said, hi, Laura. She walked, went over to the laptop and said, can I write something? Can I do email? My mother-in-law, Carol, looked drawn but calm, sitting in the rocker. She'd felt as worried as Teresa or I, but she'd pushed it back for our sake. I think she was glad to see Laura with her own eyes. Bonnie had been telling us about the camping trips she used to lead, the sing-alongs. I had my guitar and I'd been playing by Laura's bed. I knew it was a little ridiculous, the unconscious baby and the daddy playing heartfelt music to somehow get through to her, but I sang anyway. I'd started singing because Laura's blood pressure was high and I thought the singing might calm her. One nurse suggested it might. She'd seen the numbers change when parents came in the room. But mainly it was something for me to do, to make waiting easier. So Bonnie and I sang. She stood at the wheeled desk, doing charts by a small reading light. Her calm as focused as her daily talk was exuberant. We sang Ellie's favorite bedtime songs, Angel from Montgomery, Sweet Baby James, Take Me Home Country Roads, stopping now and then to remember the words. Next to me, the ventilator drew the shapes of mechanical breath. Above me, the flat screen monitor shone like a campfire. Laura did not stir. In the opposite corner of the room were Teresa and Ellie, their faces lit by the laptop. As we sang, I had the guilty feeling that all this would be much worse if it were Ellie in the bed. It occurred to me only later that when Laura was in the hospital, I did not yet love her. I may only have been looking after her. Perhaps that was why, looking down at her prostrate in a hospital bed, I was glad she was not Ellie. Perhaps those early weeks were only a down payment on a love we might come to feel, or I did not allow myself to love her in order to save myself the pain. Thinking this, I knew it was true. At the same time, I knew, because I could think it, it was no longer true. I remember when the thought first occurred to me. It was August, some weeks after we'd gotten home from the hospital. I was in my workshop, holding Laura in the ancient shed behind the house. I was looking for something essential to the furthering of a whim, a bolt, a tube of epoxy resin, an adjustable wrench, who knows what for who knows what project. Though I dislike football, and guy is a, a dialect I speak only with difficulty, I do answer stress with power tools, and I also look after children at home. So I held Laura, careful to keep her away from every sharp, pointed, and electrified thing in the shop, and rooted through sawdust and debris with my free hand. She was braced in the crook of my left arm. I leaned away from her to keep us both balanced. She twisted this way and that, inspecting the piles of offcuts from finished projects, the flickering shop lights, the exposed studs dark with age, the two by fours not nominal, but actually two inches by four inches. And as I stood by the pull down ladder, the late morning sunlight turning the dust over in its hands, I saw Laura and realized what she was to me. I gathered her against me and told her so in the best words I could find at the time. Then I carried her back into the house. I want to jump forward and talk briefly about um, um, something I, I alluded to a little bit in the introduction, which is this list, the idea that, that people with Down syndrome are described um, in terms of a list. Um, I don't want to go into it in, in depth, though I certainly do in the end notes. And in fact, one of the things my many, many friends told me and, and a couple of editors was, you know, maybe 50 pages of this or so could be cut. So, you know, you find quotes, you don't want to lose them, but, but they, they interrupt the narrative. Anyway, the pattern I found is that, you know, you, you have this syndrome, right? You, this syndrome has multiple possibilities. A chromosome has around 250 genes on it. They get switched on and off. Down syndrome looks different in every person. Some people have heart defects, some people have none. Some people have, you know, torticollis, some people do not. Some kids, I've met plenty of parents and they're like, yeah, my kid's fine. They were telling me to expect all this stuff. So it's variable. So what do you do with a syndrome that's incredibly variable and you have one description? And what do you do when you have a syndrome that has like literally hundreds of possible outcomes and you have a short space? Well, you make a list. You translate, as I tell my students, you translate multifarious language into a single line. That's where things get interesting because depending on the assumptions, agenda, proclivities of the person writing the list, the lists begin to look very different. 
and it becomes very hard to find a single definitive description of Down syndrome. If you mention something, um, do you say whether it's curable or not? Do you bring up the issue of prenatal diagnosis or not, even though that has nothing strictly to do with the individual, but more to do with an expectant mother? What, what do you include? And so I, I, the list really began to interest me. I eventually traced it back through medical history to John Langdon Down, who was the first to describe the syndrome to, to medicine. Um, but I also was thinking about the list as, as an imaginative document, as the story of a ghost. So the idea that there is this kind of mythical or ghostly creature that is like the typical Down syndrome person, and the list is, is his biography. And so I wanted to write about that as a parent. So, In general, the more recent the list, the more accurate and neutral it tends to be. The best make the developing individual central, not a footnote. But even when these criteria are satisfied, even when the depressingly usual exaggerations are set aside, there are deeper limitations inherent in the form. Every diagnostic list, by definition, sets the child with Down syndrome apart. Some writers compensate for this divide and some do not. But in the end, a parent dreams of a time when the divide does not exist in the first place, when we do not need to say a child first, when every child is seen as inhabiting a continuum of human abilities, when the idea of normal is used in a strict statistical sense and not as a divisive, emotionally loaded label, and when that label is invoked only to help the person it describes. These are typically insights that parents of disabled children arrive at simply in order to stay sane, but they're not yet generally accepted. To be a parent is to keep a story, to nurture another's identity through time. Because of this, a list is at best insufficient to the experience, at worst inimical. A list has no room for story. It is a world without individuals, a world without verbs. There is nothing about what its diagnostic subjects do. There is only what they are. What they are, of course, is not up to them. They do not describe themselves. They are only described. Um, and in, in kind of thinking about that and getting to that point, I was influenced, as I think all of us have been, by, by the work of Michael Berube, who in his memoir, Life as We Know It, um, concentrates, he talks about sign, but for him that's part of this idea of his son, Jamie, as a citizen, as someone who represents himself in every sense of the world. word. How are we doing on time? Time? About 10? Okay. Yeah. Um, one thing I try to do in the book is to have the book narrate its own going, to talk about um, what it was to write the book and, and what it meant to write the book. And this was not as an exercise. It's because um, I think that anyone who has a child with Down syndrome has to be actively engaged in the process of making meaning out of that event, out of that fact. And so I wanted to show myself doing that. So this is a short section about that. Uh, and this is from considerably later. This is from about uh, 2003. How to tell Laura's story. How to explain the way my vision had changed. Laura had long been one of us, a fully vested member of our family, and the happiness she brought us was real, without dilution or asterisk. She was a part of our story. Her trisomy had complicated that story from heart surgery to speech therapy. But her genetic beginnings, on paper, far less promising than Ellie's had resulted in no less happiness. The genome is the beginning of the story, not the end. In time, I came to see our situation this way. Laura has a double inheritance. Like Ellie, Laura inherits the extraordinary luck of an American middle-class life. She's loved, insured, and free. But unlike Ellie, she was born with a recognizable genetic disorder. As a result, she also inherits a history of misunderstanding and our anxieties about what our chromosomes have to do with who we are. Teresa said once that Laura has Laura syndrome, that I have George syndrome, and that Ellie has Ellie syndrome. We all have our risk factors. The difference with Laura is that her risk factors are known. Because chromosomes are easy to see under the microscope, because people with Down syndrome have a distinctive appearance, and because Down syndrome has been extensively studied, we could have that knowledge for one child and not for another. But for parents in the near future, and perhaps for all of us, that distinction may be coming to an end. 
There may never be a human clone or a child engineered for musical ability, but the era of personal, personalized genomic medicine, long predicted, is all but here. In the wake of the Human Genome Project, it is now possible to sequence, letter by letter, a full set of human chromosomes. A few people have had, already had this done, and though having a full personal reading of the Book of Life is still too expensive for you and me, it will soon be commonplace. As the price of a finished sequence comes down, we will each come to possess the book we already own. We will carry it to the doctor's office, on a compact disc, on an iPod, and we will live our lives by the book, adjusting our medical choices to its predictions. We will have numbers for everything, for heart de disease, lung cancer, diabetes, depression, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, obesity. We may in some cases have better medical interventions to choose from, but even when we have no cure, we will still have the numbers. In other words, we will all know our syndromes. In this way, at least, Laura, born days after the publication in Nature and Science of the draft of who we are, is typical of us all. Her inheritance is ours. got enough time to bring up this um, fast forward up, up to this point here. Um, Do you want me to leave it there? Or? What's that? Well, you can put another picture up there. You know, we downloaded three. We might as well use them. You can put the llamas okay, up there. there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so this picture, um, <laughs> this is like the family slideshow part of the presentation. So th this, is, this is Laura. Um, um, Laura does 4-H. I don't, I don't know if this is a thing people do in New York City at all, but no, in, no. it's not a lot of room to keep the llamas, but, um, <laughs> but in our, our town of 50,000, a lot of kids do 4-H. It's a big deal. And 4-H and, um, and is, uh, a lot of 4-Hers do llamas. It turns out that the llamas and the horse people don't like each other at all, like this is a thing. Like there's a lot of, I don't know. Anyway, the llama people have been great. They love Laura. And I, in fact, just last weekend, Laura was, I wasn't there, but um, she was um, injecting llamas with vitamin D and she's like apparently she's like this huge bore veterinary needle it's like nope you take it stick them in don't stick yourself so with that's what we like any activity where they're just like no you go do it you know we're, we're gonna treat you like everyone else as much as you can do so so this is her on a on a llama walk they're all laughing because one just like that llama just leaned over and kissed Laura so this is why they're all they're all laughing there um, um, you want the first sure we can do the last one and then uh, and I will um, and that's Laura, um, that's Laura dancing. Um, the one reason I wanted to put these pictures up here um, was that a picture can bring home the reality of a person in a way that a story can't. And um, I particularly wanted to have the contrast of this, this kind of very dire early stuff, which is really all about me worrying. And, and Laura as she is now. And this is not to suggest that like everything is like, you know, a dance recital and llamas. I mean, you know, she has her moments like any kid. But I, I do want to say that the, the central problem um, for a long time for me was not the fact that Laura had an extra chromosome. It was that I couldn't imagine it. I couldn't fold it into a story. And I assumed that whatever story came out of it would be dire. And that I turned out to be wrong, provably wrong about that. I don't predict the future. I know that things in adulthood for, can be tough. I, I, I've learned now not to predict, but I've also learned not to assume the worst. Um, as I said in the beginning, I want to connect this to what this forum has focused on, which is the question of genes and disability. And when um, the more conditions we can predict, the more the descriptions of those conditions are going to matter. It become, because it becomes a question of imagining what a future child is going to be like. So I'm hoping that this uh, snapshot gives us a little bit to talk about later on. Thank you. All right, so this is gonna be very different than what George presented, um, although I'm more than happy to talk about um, my daughter, Maybelle. Uh, slide is going to come up, there we go. Um, in the question and answer, but I do want to say that one of the one of the reasons that I'm so interested in having these pictures up is because Eva Kate, who is in the audience, but perhaps I shouldn't point her out, did this in a, a very early talk I saw, and it, it had a picture of her daughter Sasha up on the screen, and it's just a powerful way of humanizing 
like I'm not going to be talking about Maybell, but here she is. Okay, for the last three years, I have been interviewing women who had prenatal testing, learned that the fetus had Down syndrome, and continued the pregnancies. I was well into my research about 18 months in when I decided to start interviewing women who terminated their pregnancies because the fetus had Down syndrome. My research suggests that these are interviews that have very rarely been done if they have been done at all. I was surprised to learn that for the most part, this population of women who terminated <coughs> has not been interviewed and their decision-making process hasn't been examined from a feminist disability studies perspective. Because this population was a mystery to me, I had preconceived notions. I went into these interviews uh, expecting obvious decisions, like of course when I found that the fetus was, de was defective, I terminated. What I learned through these interviews was that my expectations and assumptions were entirely wrong. I heard stories of pain and confusion. I heard stories of love. The same stories I heard from women who had continued their pregnancies. Going into the interviews, I wasn't thinking of these women who terminated as mothers at all. I was thinking of them as potential parents. I didn't see terminating as weaker parenting because I didn't see it as parenting, but instead as a decision not to become a parent. The experience of women who terminated was exactly the opposite of what I expected. They told me that it was because of their love for their child, their willingness to sacrifice their own happiness, their desire to be a good mother, that they'd had testing and that they terminated. Um, one woman who terminated told me that the administrator of the online discussion group that she was part of told her, you are a mother. And she found that to be incredibly comforting. Another woman was told that she was a good parent by the doctor at the abortion clinic, and she found that important enough that she wanted to share it in her story. This project has been particularly interesting to me because as I've done interviews, I've done quite a bit of online public writing about terminating and continuing pregnancies. Several of the women I've interviewed, particularly of women who've terminated their pregnancies, read my work and are very attentive to the judgments I offer. Judgments they often see as distorting and or dismissing the stories they shared with me. Some private discussion boards on Baby Center are named after me. Um, several women emailed me to say that they felt I'd used them manipulatively, that I'd encouraged them to talk only to argue how wrong they were. A few have withdrawn their stories from my writing, some in extremely angry ways. So in part because of the responses I've received from women I've interviewed, in this essay I'm putting aside some of the feminist disability studies scholarship that has shaped my thinking. Um, so disability studies scholars examining prenatal testing often offer arguments that more specifically target the concerns of the women I've interviewed. So Adrian Ash and David Wasserman, this is a long quote, although we remain uncertain at the margins, we believe that most decisions to abort for or select against impairment are misguided based on harmful stereotypes, unreasonable expectations, or relentless institutional pressures. For this reason, we feel that a prospective parent should begin with a suspicion of and a presumption against the impulse to abort an impaired child. Other scholars make the same point while seemingly trying not to. So biologist Ruth Hubbard seems to struggle with it, constantly repeating her support for reproductive rights while also saying, quote, no one these days openly suggests that certain kinds of people be killed. They just should not be born. Yet that involves a process of selection and a decision about what kinds of people should and should not inhabit the world. She argues that this decision making is creating um, and supporting eugenics. I had a conversation recently with um, feminist disability studies scholar Allison Kafer, who in some ways gave me permission to make a judgment call. She asked, can you bracket your relationships with these women and just say that you disagree with them? So it's not that I think that these ideas are mistaken, but I'm not sure that they're useful in this context, and I would welcome your feedback on this. My conversations with women who've terminated their pregnancies and women who've continued theirs have invited me to take a different approach, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm not assessing, I'm sharing the stories of both sets of women, identifying not who made the right decision, but how similar their stories are. So because of the similarities in this talk, I often won't differentiate between women who terminated and women who continued their pregnancies. Um, it's not always important to know what decision they made because I want to examine the decision-making process and there's not always a clear dividing line. Almost all the women I spoke with struggled with a decision that was intensely painful to them. This was quite clear during our conversations. Many women cried while they were talking with me. Often I cried too. Um, 
Jen said, I pulled over and the nurse told me, and then I called my husband and we cried. She paused. I'm going to cry right now to say it. When we were pre preparing for our conversation, Denise emailed me and wrote, it's likely that I may cry during the interview. To be honest, I'll likely cry simply because I love her so much and miss her. I wonder if I will ever be able to conjure up the experience in narrative without any weeping. Diane didn't cry, but only from intense effort. Repeatedly during the interview, she looked down, gathered herself. As she told me the many, many painful moments during her lengthy decision-making process, her eyes filled with tears. She often looked at me fiercely, making eye contact, defending her decision as she forced herself not to cry. Kilolo told me, I was completely devastated. I felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me. The why me questions. Um, I was very tearful. I remember I cried and I wanted a drink. I remember saying to myself, well, what difference would it make anyway? You know, they say alcohol could potentially damage your fetus and it's already done. Carolyn said trying to decide was agonizing. It really was, it was agonizing. So this was not a decision they wanted to make. It was a torturous decision. Carolyn said, she, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Emily said, I literally screamed and howled like a wild animal the whole time while we were inducing my labor. Similarly, Amy said that when she learned that her child had Down syndrome, I wailed. I don't know if you can imagine the most gut-wrenching wail a grown woman can make, but it is a sound I will never forget and I hope no woman ever has to utter, but that sound came out of my throat. Denise, too, said, when I had to get the ultrasound to date the pregnancy, I lost control and was sobbing and wailing. Even four years later, talking with me, Leanne was quite emotional. Her emotion wasn't grief about her decision. It was sadness at remembering how painful the decision-making process was. So here's a long quote. I was just kind of shell-shocked. I really went through the process of deciding whether or not to go through with an abortion. I had another ultrasound, and I was almost sure I couldn't do it, that I couldn't go down the path of terminating. So I would set up little things for myself. I would have an ultrasound where they're really gonna look at the heart. If anything was wrong, I wasn't gonna go through with the pregnancy because it wasn't worth it for the child when really they could have surgery, you know. So I said, that will make my decision because I didn't really want to make that decision myself. I wanted something to determine it for me. If the heart's okay, then the heart was okay. And I said, was that a relief or like, damn it, decision still not made? And Leanne said, yeah, it was kind of like that. For Leanne, the diagnosis of Down syndrome and the decision of whether to continue with the pregnancy were traumatic experiences. She wasn't opposed to abortion in general terms. She'd had two abortions um, earlier that she didn't perceive as devastating. For this particular pregnancy, however, there was no easy decision. She was evaluating her decision by considering what would be worth it for the child, a line of questioning that came up repeatedly in these conversations. Leanne's story shows not only her suffering, but how the notion of choice doesn't always apply to the experiences pregnant women have. Leanne didn't want to have to make the decision, a decision that was intensely painful, painful so she looked for reasons to terminate, ways to escape the decision-making process. She was searching for validation or some sort of guidance about how she could do what was best for her child. Emily said, before this, I would never kill a fly, and yet I killed the thing I want the most in life, and so it's kind of like a mind fuck. She asked, how do other people make this sort of decision? It feels like there's no, nothing I can say yes to here. She went on to say, I was just completely beside myself, like what the hell am I gonna do? I've never been in a situation where I can't find some solution that works for everybody. You know, like there has to be something here that I can say yes to. She paused and sighed and then continued. So that's when I really started talking to everyone and looking at how do you make this decision? How do you make this decision? How do you make this decision? Mariah also didn't want to have to make this decision. Indeed, she wished she hadn't had prenatal testing, which is what forced her to be confronted with this decision. She wrote on her blog, I deeply regretted having the amniocentesis. I regretted knowing that she'd be coming with Down syndrome. My angst over our decision to keep her consumed me, kept me awake for most of my pregnancy, endless insomnia. Night after night, I'd relive my own most horrific moments, wondering if I made the right choice if I had simply conscripted my daughter to a life of misery. Her fears about her own daughter's misery made Mariah miserable, staying awake at night, reliving horrific memories, wondering about what would be the right choice. And Denise, too, had an experience of decision-making that far exceeded the narrative of choice. She said, this was a very planned pregnancy that I terminated last year, definitely tried for and wanted very much, and again, it was, I felt very an emergency situation and that it demanded from me what I felt was beyond just convenience. 
it was not about choice or what's good for me right now or something like that, like this. It was very under the gun. The decision had to be made quickly. And although the pregnancy was wanted very much, that didn't mean she was committed to continuing it. She told me it wasn't about choice, although she had difficulty then describing what it was about because there is no story that's available. How do you make the choice about what's best for your child, a child who may or may not enter the world because of your decision? And this is what's at the core of the suffering. All of the women I interviewed had made commitments to decisions to be mothers. They described their love for their children, the children who weren't yet born, as unconditional. Emily described this child as the thing I wanted most in life. Rebecca said, I loved him just as much as the kids I have living with me here today. Because of prenatal screening and testing, processes that are increasingly common and often presented as a medical necessity rather than as an option, non-invasive prenatal screening we can talk about. The women I spoke with had to make a second decision, the decision of whether or not to continue the pregnancy. And the fetus was a child, my child, to every single woman I spoke with. Diane had picked out a name, so had Emily, Rebecca, Kathy, Elizabeth, many others. And even if they hadn't yet picked out a name, each of the women was identifying this be being not as a clump of cells, which was often the case with other abortions, but as a person. Many knew the sex, which helped them to form a more particularized connection. Diane knew this was her son. Leanne knew this was her daughter. What the women I talked with made clear was that the prenatal testing didn't alter their understanding of the child they were carrying. Very early on in the pregnancy, even in the first trimester, many of the women were thinking about their child, and often the ultrasound was an experience that consolidated their sense that this was a child. Elizabeth told me about her prenatal screening. She said, it was the night of that ultrasound that I had this amazing dream of her name. It was that night. So she gave me three names, Rose Marie, Rosemary, and Rosalie. These three names kept swirling around in my dream. So when I woke up, I was like, wow, I hadn't even thought of these names. I was writing in my journal. I was writing all the different names down. I wrote Rosemary and Rosalie. Then I wrote Rosemary. I wrote the three, and when I wrote the name Rosemary, I started crying and crying and crying and crying, just uncontrollably crying. Then I wrote a little bit after that, like, okay, I guess that's the name. Naming is a potent rhetorical act, giving weight and substance to any idea, let alone a person. You can imagine calling Rosemary down to dinner or playing with Rosemary in a way that seems less real and less immediate when you're talking about an unnamed child or an unnamed fetus. The significance of this naming affected Elizabeth emotionally. She felt the importance, crying as she confirmed her daughter's name. Whether or not she continued the pregnancy, she was pregnant with a child she'd identified and imagined. Because they were pregnant with much anticipated, vividly imagined children, one part of the decision these mothers faced was their desire to protect their children. In conversation after conversation, women told me that they'd been pregnant with a child who was or would be suffering. They felt an intense sense of responsibility and they grappled with whether they'd be able to protect this child. Rebecca said, I've learned that the stakes are so high and you don't have any control. Many of the women, those who terminated and those who continued their pregnancies, talked about this. They worried about the extent to which their child might suffer. And some of this anxiety was based on lived experiences. Uh, for instance, Denise was raped and she had multiple sclerosis and therefore she'd experienced the vulnerability of a woman and a person with a, of a woman and a person with a disability. She told me that if she didn't want this reality for herself, she couldn't insist on it for her child. She said, the more the pregnancy continued, the more protective I became. And then when the nuchal fold grew and when the blood work was alarming, I had to decide how I was defining protective because you can think one thing in one circumstance and another in another circumstance. I had to decide what would be more protective. When she went to the abortion clinic, she became conflicted, but she said, I did feel that it was the most protect protective choice for my situation and my particular child to stay and have an abortion. And I did. Mariah faced a very similar decision-making process. Like Denise, she's a woman with a dis disability and she too was raped as a child. In an email to me, she wrote, this was the hardest part for me about keeping her. I know that women with disabilities are far more likely to be abused sexually. A woman with an intellectual disability would be even more likely to be abused. I thought, what perfect prey for a predator. A woman who can't talk or who people won't believe, who would be deemed retarded. So with pleas that won't be heard, believed, validated. 
I really wondered if bringing my child, bringing a child who would be so vulnerable into the world would be an act of pure selfishness. If it was only about me wanting my rainbow, if it would actually be better for her not to be born. So both Denise and Mariah were grappling with what was in the best interest of the child. Each of them wanted their child and each of them was concerned with a specific and statistically significant vulnerability. The possibility of being raped for people with disabilities, particularly girls, is incredibly high. I mean, the possibility of being raped for women is already incredibly high. Um, Denise decided to terminate as an act of protection and love. She released her own desires because of what she perceived as her daughter's vulnerability, which could lead to the child's suffering. Mariah assessed her daughter's vulnerability as well and she didn't know if she could provide adequate protection, but she continued with her pregnancy. Denise saw her termination as an act of selfless love. Mariah worried that she was being selfish and therefore not a good mother by keeping her child. While our culture doesn't usually frame women who terminate their pregnancies as loving mothers, both the decision to terminate a pregnancy and the decision to continue it are decisions the mothers understand as made out of love. Rebecca wrote online, in fact, strangely, I think I became a better parent by terminating the pregnancy. It was revealed to my husband and me that our children are everything to us and ensuring their welfare our primary purpose in life. We treasure every moment with them. Her termination of her pregnancy with her son was an act that ensured his welfare. She didn't make the decision out of, out of selfishness, but out of love. And she was the one who explained that I love him just as much as the kids I have living with me here today. When Rebecca and I talked, she explained her concern that I wouldn't hear her, wouldn't respect her story, but she made it very clear to me that she made her decision because of her love for her son. This concern about the child's suffering is not an individual issue created by the mothers. It is also not a decision based on the woman, which I would say is arguably often the case for abortions not resulting for, pre for prenatal testing. Women who terminated and women who continued their pregnancies were basing their decisions on their perceptions of the needs of the child. You know, before the child was born, most questions the women had couldn't be definitively answered. They could not know about their child's adulthood. They could not know how siblings would be affected by a brother or sister with Down syndrome or about their child's longer term health. This means that women who have learned that their child has Down syndrome face a difficult choice that they must make quickly because pre the pregnancy is proceeding. They often aren't able to come to any clarity about the decision. Denise told me that this was an experience she would be thinking about for the rest of her life. I asked her what she meant by that and she said, well, not in that I have guilt or regret or doubt, just that it's so deeply layered. To make a decision for myself and for an unborn person that was a tremendous responsibility, and I gathered as much information as I could to try to make the best all-around choice at this point. But no one can ever know for sure if it was the correct choice for someone else, meaning my child Chloe. I feel that I'm comfortable, with, I'm very comfortable with the choices I made for myself, but there's always that lingering exploration of what it means to make, by proxy, a decision for someone else. So there's always that lingering exploration Rarely did the women I talked to feel a sense of easy confidence, that they'd clearly made the right decision, that there was any kind of right decision that was available to them. They were faced with paradoxes and contradictions. Women like Emily Rapp, author of The Still Point of the Turning World, recently reflected on the contradiction between her passionate love for her son, who had Tay-Sachs disease, and her belief that it would have been an act of love to abort him as she says she would have if her prenatal testing had revealed his condition. She explains, it is possible to hold this paradox as part of my daily reality. In an email conversation with Elizabeth about her pregnancy with her daughter who had Down syndrome, Rosemary, Elizabeth explained, with Rosemary, she was so wanted by me. I planned her and did everything I could to get pregnant short of begging Dave for another child. The heart defect and then the Down syndrome were overwhelming pieces of news. And sometimes during the pregnancy, I wondered if the baby might die before birth and all would be better for her. <clears throat> so Elizabeth's story reveals her complex mixed feelings. On the one hand, she thought that the prenatal death of the fetus would be better for her, but then at the same time, she was so scared that, that she would die right after birth. Nancy had an incredibly similar thought process. She told me, 
Early on, I had fear mixed with a weird hope, like I might have a miscarriage and I don't have to worry about anything anymore. And simultaneously, worrying that I have a miscarriage. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make logical sense. I'm a logical person. It didn't make logical sense. Paradox and contradiction emerged again and again in these conversations. Rebecca cried as she shared her story, the story of terminating this intensely desired pregnancy. Because it was a late-term abortion for her, the process took several days. She told me, on the final day, you know, I delivered him. They had stopped his heart on the first day, but on the final day, I delivered him, and they put us in a room, and they brought him in a basket, and I just lost my mind. I was like, I don't understand why this happened. You know, I can't believe we're here. It wasn't anything about making the wrong choice. It was just the shock of being in a room with your baby who is gone and in a basket. In many ways, Rebecca most clearly articulates what's at stake in this decision. As was true with all the women I spoke with, she loved her child and she explained this as the foundation of her decision. This decision can have very different ends. Nancy wished for a miscarriage, hoping that the child would die and save her from having to make a decision, but she continued with her pregnancy. Rebecca terminated her pregnancy out of love for her child. Then she had the incredibly paradoxical experience of holding her dead child. As Raina Rapp explains in Testing Women, Testing the Fetus, ending a pregnancy to which one is already committed because of a particular diagnosed disability forces each woman to act as a moral philosopher of the limits adjudicating the standards guarding entry into the human community for which she serves as the normalizing gatekeeper. She must make conscious the fears, fantasies, and phobias she holds about mothering a disabled child. And she frequently thinks in a vacuum, lacking much social context for what a particular medic di medical diagnosis of a disability might really imply. Lacking a societal context means in part lacking a story which is a large part of what my research is addressing. Both sets of women I spoke with were telling stories that are not heard. And our society doesn't provide space for these women, for a woman to hope, to discuss hoping for a miscarriage or for a woman to discuss holding her dead child with great love. In part, we're not comfortable hearing these stories because they're painful. In addition, the stories are somewhat threatening to mainstream discourse because they offer no clear answers. None of the women I interviewed described an easy clarity as she made her decision. This is ultimately what it means to be faced with this painful, complex choice which all these women faced. As mothers said in conversations with me, conversations that happened after the, after the decision had been made, and here's just a list of quotes. Where's the out? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. As if it could get more complicated. I wanted something to determine it for me. There's always that lingering exploration. I didn't want to make that decision. And those are quotes from both sets of women. For the women I spoke with, their desire to be mothers was the same, and not just a desire, but a commitment to motherhood. Their priorities were the same. They loved their child and wanted to do what was best, most compassionate, most loving for that child. And their interpretations of the world were often the same, too. So Denise and Mariah both recognized the possibility of rape and abuse in a world that's hostile toward women and toward people with intellectual disabilities. They were faced with the same decision, and they had the same tools to grapple with it. And what I am going to conclude with is that these tools were and are inadequate. So I welcome any feedback you all have about this. Thanks. While you do that, I'm going to show other slides of Mabel because I totally oh, okay. forgot that. Yeah, so. please do that. Um, do you want to say anything about them? Or? Mabel, we went to the um, Museum of American History, and every single statue in this one part of the museum, she like made a relationship with. It was really cool. Um, and then I just love this one. We'll see in just a second when it pops up. So that can stay there. I love that. Okay, this is a bit out of order, but I, we forgot some thank yous. So, um, so I just wanted to say, since we're on film, 
um, that this, this program was co-sponsored by the American Studies Program and the Future of Disability Studies Projects. Um, but the primary sponsor is the Hyman Center, and I especially want to thank Eileen Galuli for making this night possible, but also we had a wonderful program yesterday at, at Gigi's Playhouse, um, which was all funded by Columbia. So, <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, and it's, I'm going to be very brief because I'm sure people in the audience want to ask questions and comment. A few weeks ago, I got an email message from a doctor who told me that she had loved my recent book about raising a son with Down syndrome and how much she wanted to meet. A Google search revealed that she was known for having started a program to help earthquake-ravaged Haiti rebuild its medical schools. I was intrigued and we made a plan to have coffee. When we met in person, I learned that after the Haiti project, her latest commitment is providing health care to adults with intellectual disabilities in Rockland County. It was the day of the big snowstorm. As we talked, the wind howled outside and the sidewalks filled up with white. Inside, my new acquaintance spoke passionately about her work. Let me tell you a story, she said again and again. So many narratives of people in need. A nonverbal man with cerebral palsy who wanted a sex life. A woman with Down syndrome whose relatives insisted that she receive general anesthesia for a pap smear. Another woman so large, other doctors refused to examine her. So all of these stories and what this doctor was able to do for them. I left the cafe inspired by what this doctor had accomplished. I added her to the list of the many connections I've made through my book, which to my great pleasure and unlike other writing I've done, seems to make people want to share their own stories with me. Writing this book has made me deeply aware of the power of narrative to build empathy, to forge connections, and promote material change. I think this is the most important meaning to be drawn from the papers presented today. By two authors, I also count among the wonderful people who came into my life by way of narrative. What I most appreciate about the work of Alison Peepmeyer and George Estrake is the way it translates the specificities of embodied experience into stories rich with theoretical knowledge that helps us to make sense of some of the most pressing ethical questions confronting our society today. As this is abundantly clear, like Jordana and I, each is the parent of a child with Down syndrome. Um, which I think is a, a condition that's really on the pulse of these questions. I just, I'm on leave this semester and I, I decided I'm going to learn about bioethics. So I, I went to the first class today and it took um, 54 minutes for Down syndrome to come up out of the two hour class. So George thought that was actually a long time, but I, I knew it would come on the first day and then it, it shadowed the rest of the conversation. I think I can speak for us all when I say that our adventures in parenting have led us into entirely new and unexpected experiences, acquaintance, and fields of knowledge. Tonight, George and Allison have shared with us some of the ways they've used narrative to make sense of those experiences. I first heard about Allison through a colleague who recommended her blog, Baxter Says, which is now every little thing. There I was struck by her lively writing, the honesty and insight of the story she shared about her life, and her fearlessness in tackling thorny social and political matters. Allison's paper today is very much in that vein. It makes the controversial claim that women who choose to abort a fetus with Down syndrome and those who choose to keep the pregnancy are ultimately driven by the same motivations. As she puts it, Quote, all the mothers I talked to made their decisions out of love for this particular child. Although their framing of what this love requires is different, what underlay their decisions was quite similar, the, the desire to do what was best for their child. This talk, which comes from a larger project about Down syndrome, pregnancy, and prenatal testing, 
speaks to the importance of Piet Meyer's project. At a moment when doctors and scientists dominate the discourse about the meaning and consequences of genetic disability, a project that gives voices to the experiences, thoughts, and motivations of pregnant women along the lines of Raina Rapp's influential study of um, the year 2000, testing women, testing the fetus. And I think it's really stunning how similar the stories are. I mean, it's really distressing also how little anything has changed. Um, so th these kind of projects are sorely needed as a counterbalance. I admire Pete Meyer's impulse to put aside political and emotional considerations by giving equal weight to women who made many different choices. Allison has chosen to share one of the most difficult and controversial aspects of that study with us tonight, the section where she attempts to make sense of the stories of women who aborted a pregnancy after receiving a positive diagnosis of genetic disability. Allison's talk raises several questions for me that I offer as a starting point for discussion. First, I wonder whether there's a place in this conversation for um, I guess as a literary critic, I would call them unreliable narrators. Uh, although, who is reliable in this context? The internet has made available many forums for women who have terminated an otherwise wanted pregnancy because of genetic disability. Women in the past who might have felt alone in their grief and shame. So I think um, the stories are unheard, but I think there are, you can tell me if I'm wrong, more opportunities to share these stories. Like stories of any other collective narrative of trauma, these stories have a similarity that suggests they do, to a certain extent, they are, to a certain extent, a product of their author's exposure to other stories. In Allison's work, there's a very commendable desire to take the stories of her informants completely seriously, as if they were a transparent account of the teller's motivations. But I wonder if there's a place to acknowledge that an account of one's motivations, especially an account offered to someone who's doing research, especially a person who has disclosed that she is herself the parent of a child with Down syndrome, um, is this perhaps not necessarily the same thing as, um, I, I don't know how else to put it, but one's actual motivations. I don't know that you can ever get it, or perhaps one has different versions of the story. Is it worth recognizing how the story of the woman who ended a pregnancy out of love serves the needs of the teller? And I, we've actually talked about these questions, and I think you have some fascinating, there's more to be said that I hope you'll speak to. I also want to invite Allison to put a bit more pressure on the category of love. In what way is the love of a woman who aborted her fetus and is therefore completely hypothetical, even if she imagines the potential child vividly, even if it has a name? Is it really, is, is lo love the same word that we want to use as the love of a woman who did not abort and therefore is attached to a living child with all the attendant joys, frustrations, and complexities. Even if both groups of women are using the same word and claiming the fetus as my child, are these the same kinds of claims? And if not, is it worth reflecting on the differences? What do we do with that? Where Allison's work gives voice to many women whose stories might otherwise be unheard, George's project focuses on his own story. His memoir, The Shape of the Eye, is beautifully written. I hope if you haven't read it, you should all buy a copy on the way out. Its lyrical prose, vivid and creative <coughs> images, make clear the author's origins as a poet. At the same time, this is the work of an astute social critic who uses experience as a conduit to address broader social and political concerns. Although there are now quite a few memoirs by the parents of children with Down syndrome, George is unique to my knowledge, although you didn't really, maybe you'll speak more to this in the discussion. He, he didn't tell you this part, but this is another reason you would all want to read his book. 
unique in addressing the racialization of disability, tracing an implicit lineage from the historic connections made by John Langdon Down between Down syndrome and the Mongol race to his own Jewish American Japanese heritage. I, okay, now, um, George, I'm going to just read this because I, George <laughs> pulled the rug out from under me. I apologize. He, he was going to read sorry. his work backwards. And so in my response, <laughs> I said, I appreciate this unusual decision because what, what I thought he was doing was um, symbolically performing the wish expressed repeatedly, which I think the photos are also expressing, by parents of children with Down syndrome that the confusion, fear, and disappointment of the initial diagnosis could be dispelled by knowledge of the future happiness that child would bring to her family. Here are just two questions for George, and then I'll end. I notice a self-reflexivity in many of the passages chosen for this reading, and again, he had to cut down, so you didn't get all of them, but um, they're all worthy. So. Read the book. Um, but the, the passages foreground the textuality of genetic knowledge. So in one place, he calls the draft of the human genome um, the ultimate personal essay. Um, the textuality of genetic knowledge, of the personal story, and of the writing process. What is the meaning of this double move that acknowledges the narrativity of genetic science, but also the way that genes have yielded the highly personal narrative of life with Laura. So I, I wanted to invite George to talk to us about the value and cultural work of personal narrative. Also perhaps um, yesterday we were discussing its limitations, so that might be another dimension. Can you speculate about why narratives like yours and the many other parents now writing about experiences of parenting children with genetic disabilities can be, this is my pet peeve, at once so popular and widely read, and yet so devalued in comparison with the more impersonal narratives of scientists and doctors. My final question is related to both papers, and both speakers may want to respond, but I, I'm going to direct it to George. This panel was designed to be a successor to a thought-provoking set of presentations by Faye Ginsburg. Raina Rapp and Michael Barabay on genes, children, and ethics. So I wanted to carry the ethics dimension of that conversation over to our panel tonight and ask a question that comes up around my own personal writing. What are the ethical questions and challenges that arise when writing about others? I sense both of you thinking deeply about these issues. Allison, in the careful and perhaps overly generous treatment of your informant stories, and George, in trying to give voice to Laura as she grows up and becomes more capable of representing herself. But could you perhaps say more about what you think are the issues that arise in writing about others, specifically one's own child and family, and how you've addressed those concerns in both your writing and in the events surrounding it? And I have much more to say, but I'm going to stop there to leave time for anything the two of you want to respond, and then um, for any questions and comments from the audience. Um, so thank you so, so much. Let me say I have I, I've discovered it's gotten worse and worse. Um, I have the academics tendency to, I mean, I can take the next 20 minutes answering your questions. So I kind of want, I kind of want to hold back because I have a million thoughts, but I really have a hard time not talking. So I may let you talk first. <laughs> or open it up to questions. I mean, I have oh, you're not going to answer. Okay. No, I'm, I'm going to try to restrain myself a tiny bit and not be the first one yeah. to speak. Well, let me, um, so thank you, Rachel. And, and I, I really apologize for pulling the rug out. I had this whole thing and I then like I, it I changed ways. it. I like it both ways. It's good either yeah. way you read it. Well, it, I, um, on the ethical questions, so there were, there were two main ethical problems, I guess, that I faced in the writing of this book. One, one is that how do I represent Laura fairly? And the other was how do I represent my mother? I, I didn't read this part, uh, but it, it's, it's a thread going throughout. Um, my mother's Japanese. Um, very long story short, in the beginning, it, it didn't go well around Laura. 
between us. And a lot of that had to do with the, histor the historical misunderstanding of the confusion between Down syndrome and Asian identity. So the original name for Down syndrome was Mongolian idiocy. That's because the, um, the physician who first named it had the theory that the children were disabled because they had essentially fallen down the ladder of humankind. They had, they had dropped a rung from white to Asian. He also claimed to have um, um, representatives of other groups at his asylum. Those were actually fraudulent claims, but I, I can talk about that too. Um, the ethical question was, you know, there were, there were genuine difficulties between me and my mom, which were kind of catalyzed by Laura's arrival. Um, I don't have a simple answer. I kind of went with my gut and my conscience. I don't embrace the view that you should just do what you want as long as it's not actionable. I actually think that even though that represents itself as a kind of a bravery, I think it's kind of a dodge. I think that when you are writing about real people, especially when you're writing about real people, um, moral obligations obtain. Uh, in my case, I was trying to write a book about inheritance, which is to say both the errors that we've inherited from the past, but also the strength we've inherited from the past, how as parents we take on, we try and revise our parents' lessons, we try and take what was good and move that forward. If I was writing a book to honor those links, it wouldn't do to write the story in a way which destroyed them. Um, in terms of writing about Laura, um, I didn't know. I, she wasn't able, she can't read the book now. She, she knows about it, she knows a lot of stuff that's in it. She's not ready to read it yet, though she's, she's reading. Um, so I just kind of, um, again, went with conscience and hoped that she would be okay with it. Um, as it happens, it's, it's okay. As I write, she, um, I was talking with her on the phone last night. She's like, well, they like my book? Yes, I, yeah, yeah, they liked your book. And so this is, you know, this is her sense. She actually has a very possessive sense of this book. And, um, so, um, on to the, the question of textuality, and, or, or I don't know, that's too fancy a word for me. Or, um, the question of referring to genes as a kind of text, I mean, they are, you know, they're the, it's, it's, it's hardly even a metaphor. I mean, they are, um, but, um, a lot of that stuff is, um, endemic to talking about genes. Um, especially the phrase, the book of life. And what I wanted to do was to play with that. I, I was thinking less as a theorist than as a writer, where if you take a, a, a given piece of language, you want to play with it and ornament it and see where that leads you. So. And I'll throw out something brief here. Oh, I promise it will be brief. Um, I really struggle with these interviews. So many women have shared such personal stuff with me. The women who terminated in particular are often sharing things with me that they have not shared with anyone else. Some of them have told their closest friends that they miscarried. So the fact that they are willing to share these stories with me feels like an incredibly generous act. I, I can't write a book that makes everybody happy. And if I write a book that makes everybody happy, it's not a good book. Um, and so, uh, honestly, I don't know what to do to respect the stories that people have told me. And this, this particular piece really is me just trying to sort of say, here are the stories, here are the similarities. But this is not the whole book I'm writing. Um, so it's, it's incredibly challenging. And I know that I've pissed a lot of people off, and I'm going to piss more people off. And that's, I'm just going to have to recognize that that's part of this process. But I want to respect everyone who's very generously shared her story with me, almost all women. Um, and then just for how to write about Maybell, I wanted to throw into this, um, I don't know if any of you read the zine East Village Inky, which is written here in New York. Anne Halliday is the person who created it. It's great. If you haven't read it, you should totally get your hands on it. East Village Inky. Um, and she and I talked about uh, the fact that she's writing about her children. And she, too, sort of went with just her instinct, you know, that she uses their real names. She talks about where they live. You get the zine by writing to her home address. Um, hmm. And now that her kids are old enough, they get to read what she's written, and they get to say, no, no, don't include that. But when they were younger, they didn't, and so she really just tried to be respectful of them, but in this way where she was sort of guessing. Not everybody does that. Some of the women I know who write about their kids don't use names, don't post pictures. Uh, so I don't know that there's a right answer to that. I think yeah. that's something that we're right. feeling out. Do you 
to you. Do you want Should I fall on people? Or do you enjoy Dana? Do you want to call me? Like, what point do you like to do? Do you want to relax at all? Um, <laughs> well, I can see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, Eva. Thank you, Pastor. Wonderful. I'll be here tonight. My voice is very bad right now. We're all. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, lady, please. Wonderful, wonderful presentations. I have uh, a number of questions for both of you. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to say, I mean, you both, you're all talking very much about Down syndrome. And so uh, my child is not Down syndrome. Uh, so, so I uh, um, have to say that uh, uh, very many of the things that you're saying are not particular to the question of Down syndrome. And the whole question of misunderstanding the causal syndrome, it's not the causal syndrome. <laughs> I mean, that may be another, that may one be one particular set of misunderstandings. But, you know, the world has already determined what it's thinking about our children. Right? Uh, and it's, you know, generally not a very good story that they're telling. Uh, so, um, uh, so I, I just wanted to sort of make that point about, about the syndrome. And, and, and about the, well, let me say this about telling the stories then, too, because putting the picture on, giving a name, <coughs> talking about the particularities, to me, it's the only way to get through. It's the only way to say, this is a real individual, right? This is a particular individual. And speaking in generalities won't do that. And I do think that even though to speak to Rachel's question about why are they so popular and yet so devalued, I I think that uh, they are still devalued, but they are making a difference. These stories make a difference. Uh, and it makes a difference even to those people who write those impersonal stories, or the ones who are their training. <laughs> I have a particular question, which is a comment to ask Allison. Um, it's, it's fascinating to think about this decision as being a decision made out of a child. And, and, um, but how do they, or how do we distinguish between, I mean, how is it that one could make a life-death decision for an individual one takes to be one's child already, uh, and uh, not be this way? Because probably the same women would not have felt entitled, or I certainly felt entitled if I had been in their position, <laughs> to then make those life-death decisions post-birth. So, uh, it's a, it's like your question, Rachel, about the different kinds of loves, but it's particularly about the relationship between love and making that decision. Yeah, right, Peter Singer's the one who believes you should be able to, you know, terminate the life after the kid is born. Um, this question of what does love mean and the notion that, that the women I've spoken with are maybe unreliable narrators, right? Um, and what do we want to know about their actual motivation? I don't know what to do with that yet. Because it's very easy for me to say that they're not reliable narrators. It's easy for me to say they are responding to a myth and stereotypes and stigma that their culture has given them. Now, I think that that's true, right? I think our culture does a terrible job. And I think the point George made about, you know, you thought you didn't have opinions, but in fact you did. If you cry when a kid's born, then it's like, yeah, you had, you know, you had some opinions. You had knowledge that your culture had given you. Um, 
and I'm at this place where I am trying to discover what I can do to respect the stories that they've told me and to recognize that nobody that I've interviewed is a reliable narrator. I mean, just because the women who continued their pregnancies tell me stories and I'm laughing and like, oh, maybe I'll too. Does that mean that they're reliable narrators? Because we all are like, yes, look at our adorable children laughing on the porch. Um, you know, I don't know that I can assume that those, those stories are any more actual. Um, so this is not me answering your question, but this is just throwing another twist into it. A couple of the women I've interviewed, three women of the women I've, I've interviewed who have terminated their pregnancies have engaged in lengthy email conversations with me. And they often disagree pretty significantly with what I've written, but they're willing to talk with me about it. And so, for instance, I wrote in my margins here this question about unreliable narrators and actual motivations. I'm gonna talk about that with the woman who I call Rebecca in here. Um, I'm gonna email her about that. What do you think about that? You know, like, how do you make sense of that? What, what are your thoughts? Um, the fact that some of these women are willing to have these deep conversations with me Honestly, it just makes this more confusing and more complex. I don't know that it gives me a lot of clarity, but it's, it's making it difficult for me to make easy judgments, even though I think our cultural understanding, I mean, I think these decisions are eugenic, right? I mean, this, I think that is absolutely the case, without question. And if I say that, that cuts off the conversation and I just don't know what is useful in this moment. So just to follow up on, <clears throat> on that I th and on Rachel's question, I, th I think maybe we need to distinguish between an unreliable narrator and the necessary distortions that <clears throat> come from simply having a point of view. Mm -hmm. So there's no, you know, unreliable, I would say is, is like in terms of being distorting or omitting significant facts, I would count as unreliable. But as, as Allison pointed out, I, I would also say that, you know, <clears throat> everyone has a position. The, the question then is more like, how is that framed? Because I've seen, I've seen people dismissed on both counts in discussion. It's like, well, well, of course you'd believe that. You have to believe that. You have a kid with Down syndrome. So you have to be sunny about it. And so that, that very fact of that personal experience becomes a, the, the subtext for a blanket dismissal. And so, and I, I think it, it's just like, it becomes a matter of like, well, can we distinguish between, you know, the distortions any of us have from being situated, from being, being unreliable? And I, I suspect Allison is going to get the whole range of that in her, in her interviews. Yeah. I can be in the I wanted to know how they thought differently about fetus and child. So the quick answer, and, and this is based on my own experience too, the women I spoke with were who continued and women who terminated their pregnancies had had abortions in the past that were, I mean, I think across the board with the women I spoke to, really 40% of American women have had them, so they're very common. Um, it, these were decisions based on, I'm not ready, this is a child who was conceived by an act of abuse, um, I'm finishing up school, I don't have the money, decisions, that, so this was a fetus, this is not the right time for this fetus to come into my life because of my situation, you know, because I am not ready or I can't do it. Um, and that seems like is then a fetus, is a cluster of cells. Uh, and because these were intentional pregnancies, I mean, you don't have prenatal testing if it's an accidental pregnancy that you plan to terminate. You know, you're not going to go get an amniocentesis if it's a, a pregnancy that you're planning to abort. Um, that's why I think that's the difference. Like, this is a child. This is somebody I want. This is somebody I'm getting excellent medical care because I really want this pregnancy to happen. So <coughs> that's my sense of the difference. Um, okay, Tyler. Tyler? Three, three, I hope, hopefully very quick questions. 
Um, so one is to kind of um, each of you in different kind of gestures have talked about um, conditions. Um, this is a, this is a condition, and I wanted to kind of maybe um, explore if you could explore a little bit the relationship between a condition and identity, and a condition and an identity. So for example, like we think of being like being born into poverty is a condition, but being born black is an identity. And when you think of like socio historical <coughs> context, those things might be actually much harder to parse out, tease out. Um, but in terms of kind of proximity, in terms of the ability to disidentify, um, whatever, um, to kind of explore that a bit, um, maybe, if it's interesting. Um, second is thinking about um, this, this ex I'm not sure if I can't remember exactly what you called it, but like the social cultural vacuum that mothers enter into and not having a lot of other stories to draw from when they make that decision. Did any mothers seek those stories out? Did any mothers try to have conversations with adults who were living with Down syndrome to kind of make that vacuum maybe a little more populated. Um, and then the third, um, as me, um, as someone who's entering, I'm in the, in, in the fall I'm entering into a PhD program either in psychology or neuroscience. And um, as someone who's really deeply invested in asking these questions and in learning more about whatever, um, disability and our whatever, um, are there ways that scientists can be doing work in meaningful ways um, because as we talk about scientists and the role that scientists plays very often, it's antagonism. Very often it's scientists as m medicalizing identities, experiences, etc. Um, what other kinds of work can scientists be doing? Sure. Um, condition versus, versus identity is a great question and it's a great difference. And I, uh, one of the reasons I think we're probably, I'm certainly careful with identity is because so often people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities are defined by that Downs person. It's sort of like not a person, a Downs person. And so I think that's why I'm, I'm, I'm careful with identity. Um, although I like the idea of it becoming, like this is part of who I am. Like I have Down syndrome. This is not something I have to apologize for. This is not a condition. So I like that notion, but I think we're probably all being careful with that because of how loaded intellectual disability in particular um, has been, I don't know the answer to the science question. Um, <laughs> and what was the second question now? I should have written it down. Um, just your, uh, that vacuum. Mothers and mothers oh, and yes, <laughs> yes. So um, the, uh, both sets of, of women sometimes, right, sometimes had, gone, had sought out um, individuals with Down syndrome. Brian Scottco, who's in Boston, Who's fabulous doctor. That's one of the things he set up. He set up a program so that any parent or any pregnant person who wants to can meet adults with Down syndrome and talk to them. Um, some of the women who terminated their pregnancies had people with Down syndrome in their families, and that's why they terminated. So it's not always the case. I mean, this is like there are no clear cut answers. If you meet a person with Down syndrome, then you'll continue the pregnancy. No, sometimes it's the opposite. So not everybody did, but some women on both sides did. Um. So on, on the question of science, um, I, I agree, it, it can get very riven, and especially not even scientists, but between parents and doctors. I mean, if you think about it, just kids with Down syndrome as a population have more medical problems. That means more encounters with doctors are often in very fraught and difficult situations. And so there can be a lot of, of tension there. Um, so. I think what I would want scientists to know, and, um, and I should say my wife is a pharmacologist, at, although her specialty is, is uh, cell signaling, so she's, um, but I, I'm not against science at all. In fact, if it weren't for science and medicine, Laura wouldn't be here. She, would, she wouldn't have made it past five or six months. Um, what I tried to describe or analyze in my book was departures from science under the guise of science, which is to say uh, descriptions that sounded science-y because they had numbers in them, but were, were um, deeply not. So there's a book, for example, uh, by a genetic counselor named Aubrey Malunsky called Your Genetic De Destiny. And his description of Down syndrome is, is long and technically accurate. And, and it talks about how um, you know now people with Down syndrome have a life expectancy in um, excess of 60 and up until this point it's just been like this feature this feature and this feature and it's like because of this life expectancy siblings 
are often uh, forced to care for these people, and the, in the case that they are not, they become a burden to the state. So this, was, this is in what is allegedly a described, and what I found in looking through the history of descriptions was that, um, that things that looked objective, beginning with John Langdon Downs, which is deeply racialized, which, which is um, uh, the phrase dirty yellow skin is one that comes to mind. Um, that continues that that um, that they're permeated with um, with ethical beliefs, with social beliefs, and so on, and and in all sorts of ways. Um, I would want scientists to know the power of those descriptions, and to know the difference between a description and a prescription, and to and further. Well, since I'm, <laughs> I've got my Christmas list out, um, I I would I would say that the standard story of Down syndrome as it, that you'll get in a pamphlet is a whole lot of bad things with a happy footnote. So it's like, you know, they get this, they get this, they get this, they get this, they get this. So that's a they, a population, not an individual. And then there's a little, maybe a little footnote. It's like, well, they can have happy lives, but it's at that point, it just seems like a real tiny light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I would want people who are describing Down syndrome to know the power of that description and to know that a description of a population is a very limited thing that it's one way of knowing things, to paraphrase the, uh, Jonathan Marx, uh, but that science is not the only way of knowing things. And the scientific I, method I, is you pretty You know, good. Tinkerbell is not around to grant me this wish, but you know, yeah. I can yeah. <laughs> Well, and of course, science is, is absolutely shaped by right. culture. Right. The scientific method, I think, is pretty good, right. but scientific conclusions, and, and yeah, absolutely shaped by culture. OK, so we are running out of time. OK, so I'm just I'm going to take Two more quick, because I know you had a question and Nikki had a question. So, and then we can have more conversation afterwards. So yeah, how we'll about you and then so. Well, I was, I was struck by um, Alice and your description of uh, how many of the parents who wrote how both sides kind of thought about the experience of children with, de of, with Down syndrome as being a life Pain, and sort of how applicable so many of those things were to any human life, and and how you know there's something about the, the amniocentesis kind of creating a narrative that is somehow like more limited and more concrete, and I mean more limited in sort of in sort of the way that you think about a child's life, you know, like if you're a pregnant person. And, and, and kind of, I guess, not limited. I, I want to say frames of how you might think about what the life of a child looks like in a way that many parents don't think about the life of a child when they're becoming pregnant. And um, I guess I, I don't know if I exactly have a question, but I think it's sort of the way that 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 similarity with the um, how George described um, one dog the his typically developing daughter in contrast to, to, um, to your child with Down syndrome and just how, I guess how you think about how parents think about becoming parents, any parent thinks about becoming a parent, and how, um, I guess, amniocentesis might really change how, how, like what that looks like, what that, but I guess the, the idea of like thinking that you can prevent any child from being raped or, um, you know, being in pain and, how little we can predict the lives of our children and like how, I guess, I'm not sure I have a question exactly, but I just, what are your thoughts about that? Because that, that was really how, what struck me about this description. It's like, well, I don't want them to be in pain. I don't want them to, and well, then why are you having a kid? Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm not. Like, no, I know. So, so some of the women I've talked to, so I absolutely think amniocentesis and non-invasive prenatal testing shape the experience of a pregnancy, but they shape the experience of a pregnancy if something is discovered. Women who've had these procedures and, and everything was fine um, don't even remember them. Um, women I've talked to, I've said this very thing, right? Like, it's, I, I think that's a great point. Every child is going to have Ellie syndrome and Laura syndrome or whatever. But the women I've talked to who've terminated have said, absolutely, that's the case. But this is one difficulty I can prevent. So if I can prevent this one difficulty, yeah, other baggage may come along with another pregnancy. But it will be an act of generosity and kindness to prevent. You know, I can see this one. We should get rid of it. Should we have it? Yeah. Okay. Nikki. Okay. Um, 
But so I am also a parent of a child with Down syndrome, and I have a birth diagnosis. And for me, the, the story that was missing was the story of adulthood. And I wanted to find a way to imagine the possibility that my son would have a complex emotional life as an adult, a complex life. And I just didn't know how to get there. I trusted that it would be true. But so I'm, I think that there's a real place and a real need for um, the narratives of adults with Down syndrome. And I just, I wonder, I guess, if you can elaborate on a little bit more what, you know, maybe independent of the prenatal conversation, what your experience has been in doing your work and your research and your writing about your own life about, um, you know, have the community of parents that you've been involved with or been creating been looking to, um, how they've been engaging with the adult, adults with Down syndrome. Okay, my, so my quick anecdotal answer to this question when kids were born 30 years ago with Down syndrome, the parents were told, you're going to have to institutionalize this child. When Maybell was born and I also had a birth diagnosis, I was told, you know, there are 250 college programs nationwide for people with intellectual disabilities. So I was given this narrative of, like, the world has changed. Like, Maybell might be able to go to college if she wants to. Um, it's hard to know what adulthood is going to be like for my child because things are changing so radically, so quickly. Um, so, yeah, I've talked to a number of adults. Um, and you know, I've taught a number of adults because they're part of the inclusive college program at my school. Um, and I think, you know, their lives are really different in a lot of ways. They're individuals in the world, and they're facing limitations, and they're facing limitations created by our culture, created by society. But I also just think it's it's almost impossible to predict, just because our understanding of Down syndrome and the resources that are available. Are changing pretty radically. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looking to people who are you know, as sources of historical, like you know, they they were born into a world that was told to institutionalize them, but they, they weren't. They were a part of the inclusive education, and as it began here, and so seeing them as um, sources of, of knowledge and um, experience that's historical in nature and vital to not just our own understanding as parents of young kids now as we sort of want to inform a sense of hope, but you know, informing our sort of understanding of what the past few decades have looked like. So I, I would just add really briefly that as a society we do better with kids than with adults with Down syndrome. Yeah. And there are some um, there are some reasons for that that are not all that savory. One is that the you know the dominant way of representing disabled people is to infantilize them, especially with intellectual disability. The idea that they, quote, are childlike is something that, that goes down easy for people. So it, I think it becomes easier to provide services. Adults are, are, are a different matter. And I think that the, the changes Allison talked about um, are going to result in those stories that you talk about. I think there are very few of those stories because people have only had the right to be educated since about 1975. So, and in elementary schools. In elementary yeah, schools. Not college. And that's still working its way through. And as any parent will tell you, there's, you know, there's situations with, with education are rarely ideal. So as that improves, as acceptance improves, then I think the adult stories will come, but I think we're not there yet. Adults with Down syndrome have sex. Like, I just think that's part of the infantilizing thing, right? Right. I mean, that's just useful. Right. Like, absolutely, have some sex, go drinking, like, have a college life, enjoy yourself. Okay, so on that note. <laughs> <laughs>